Good morning. I think this is on. I think I hear it. Okay. Most people know me know I don't really need a microphone. My voice carries very, very well. I always attribute it to my uh, Free Will Baptist background. My grandfather was a Free Will Baptist preacher, who I'm proud of that legacy. Amen. I would say this, I am a Christian by choice and a Free Will Baptist by conviction. You know what I mean? Because the Bible tells us, whosoever will, let him come. So therefore, I'm a free will Baptist by choice. But I am convicted based upon the word of God as to be a free will Baptist. So, today, what a day that'll be. You know, it's a great song because today is actually the day that we celebrate Pentecost. This is Pentecost Sunday. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about the Holy Spirit created change. And... um, it's, it's interesting that it's windy outside because there was a mighty rushing wind that came in. So I was thinking, I stepped out the car, I think, whoa, man, that's a mighty rushing wind. What a great event. It's, I love wind anyway. I love not, not the violent wind, of course, but uh, that. Just a little bit about me. My wife said, uh, I was listening to your, um, um, I was listening to your uh, live stream from last week, um, this morning. I was like getting a little background information on what I'm coming into, you know. So I was listening to that last week, and I heard Brother Jeff say, well, David Barber's coming next week. I don't know nothing about him. So I said, well, let me tell you. I told him, I said, well, I guess I'm going to have to say something about myself. And I said, what can I say? So I'm riding over here at this point. I said, what can I say? What can I say? I said, oh, I know. I can say, Haley Nairn is my second cousin. And my first cousin, her mama, is with us today, too. They appreciate y'all being here. Um, we have a... Um, very strong um, uh, Free Will Baptist background in our families. Uh, we appreciate that and appreciate them being involved in the, our, our, that, that. Growing up, knowing about God is important, Amen. but knowing God is the most important thing. Amen, and it's uh, sad to say not all of us in our family know God, That's right. but they knew yeah. about God. Yeah. So, anyway, today, if you get your Bibles out and turn to Acts chapter 2, we're going to look in Acts chapter 2, and we're, just keep your Bibles open because we're probably going to hit several verses throughout this passage. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's like 40-some verses, and I could read the whole thing, but then I might lose half of you halfway through the middle of it, so I just soon hit the verses when you need it. But while you're looking at that, I'll give you a background on myself besides that. Um, I, um, some of you, if, did any of you ever go to Camp Dixie? Uh, as a young person going to youth camp with Camp Ray, many, many years ago when Stan Coker was the pastor. Anybody? Okay. I was in charge of youth camp during that time period. I don't know if y'all knew me or not, uh, but I was in charge of the junior camp of the week. Uh, for I was there for about 10, 15 years. I was in camp with those guys. I was on the youth board with them. I had a great time with, with Stan Coker and with uh, Scott Bullman, who now, if you know, you watch anything on... Uh, on um, uh, Liberty, uh, Liberty Baptist Church, their presentations up at Liberty. Uh, he's uh, their song leader up there. He's been up there a number of years. But uh, we had a really great group of people. Billy Keith, I think Billy Keith is still, is he state, is he still a state guy? For state, for, for Free Baptist, the state guy for that? He's at Prospect. He's at Prospect, okay. All right, Prospect. Well, Billy Keith was also on the board at the time. And uh, we also had Brother Sam Truitt, whose son is Chris Truitt, who pastors out in Bethel. And uh, Kentston was also on the board. We had a, a really great group of people, and, and the Lord blessed our efforts in that there. So I was with them for about 15 years. I've been in charge. I've been in youth work for about oh, 40-some years. I'm 60 years old, so I started when I was 16. Um, and the Lord has uh, given us great opportunities. He's led me in this new pathway here now for us too, so that's where I'm at today. My wife said, keep it short. My resume is three pages, so I don't want to go into all that. So, so in Acts chapter 2, if you would get your Bibles, and turn to Acts chapter 2. We're going to read just the first two verses to get started. The Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Let's pray. Lord, I pray right now that you would do exactly what you did on the day of Pentecost. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fill this building. Lord, it's not what David Barber has to say, but Lord, it's what you have to say. I pray, Lord, that you would let me be the, the tool, as was mentioned earlier, to proclaim the truth of your word. It's not me, but you. Lord, if the, we know that your word tells us that your word will not return to you void. 
So I pray, Lord, that your word have power, that it pierce the hearts and lives of men, women, boys, and girls who may be in the, in the congregation or listening to it on live stream. I pray, Lord, that your will be done and we give you the praise and the honor and the glory for all that you said and done today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, Pentecost. Well, interesting, if I say Pentecost, Pentecost is actually the Greek name for the festivals that were being done. Actually, there was uh, two festivals that the Jews had. One of them was called the, um, let's see, one of them was called the Festival of uh, the Wheat Harvest and the other the Feast, Feast of Weeks. Pentecost is actually, Pentecost stood for 50 days. And it took place 50 days after the celebration of the barley harvest and the beginning of the wheat harvest. I think it's interesting that the Holy Spirit would come when it was time to gather the wheat. Because you know, Jesus said the field is right ready for harvest. And I think the Holy Spirit came upon them to give them the ability, the power. The Holy Spirit gives us the power. Amen. That's what makes the church of God different than anything else is that we don't have to rely upon our own weaknesses and our own frailties. We can rely upon the almighty power of God Amen, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus said to them, listen, you know, I can tell you a lot of things. I can do a lot of things. I can die on the cross for your sins. But you need power. And the only way I can get you power is for me to go to the Father and to send the Comforter because He will give you the power. So on the day of Pentecost, the church was in waiting to begin. So we see there was uh, there's actually several festivals and I'm not going to recover all that the information. I, I'm a researcher so I have lots of information that sometimes is useless information so I just keep saying it. Uh, <laughs> but what happened on this particular day? You know, we talk about what a day, the song that Jeff sang. What a day. What a day over 2,000 years ago when the disciples and the, the, the disciples gathered in the room. What happened on this particular day? You may remember on Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, we see that Jesus gives the earthly message, the last earthly message to his, to his disciples. The last thing he says to them on this earth while he was here before he ascended. He says on Acts 1, 4, 4, verses 4, 5, and 8, he says, um, I'm drop down a little bit. He says, But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Then they, there, then they, uh, there, I'm going to jump down to verse 8. Um, but ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. See, Jesus knew for these people to be witnesses and to be able to accomplish the task that they needed, they needed the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, the church today needs the Holy Spirit. Amen. It needs the power of God in whatever we do. First of all, you can't be saved without the Holy Spirit. You understand me? There's no such second work of grace. There's a work, first work of grace. And that work of grace was Jesus dying on the cross for your sins. And then you accepting it. And once you accept it, that's what makes the transition. That's what makes the change in your life. Is the Holy Spirit comes in and converts you from an old creature to a new creature. You know, the Bible says that all things have passed away. All things have become new. We're new creatures through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we see that we see Jesus said, wait for it. You know, wait until God gives you the power to do what you need to do. Don't do it on your own. Amen. How many times do we want to do things on our own, folks? Yeah, right. And we fail. Amen. And we say, I don't know why this didn't happen. Because we didn't pray about it. We didn't fast about it. We didn't seek God's will about it. We just went out and did it on our own. Amen. Awesome. Our own is going to fail. We have to have the power of God in our lives. That's why when you, I know you folks are looking for a pastor. When you're looking for a pastor, you need to pray that God sends you who you want. Amen. Who he wants you to have. Right? Yep. That he preached to you the words that you need to hear. Amen. So that you have power. The Holy Spirit's power so that you can go forth and do the things that you need to do. He says then, uh, uh, we see that uh, then in verse two, chapter 2, verse 2, it says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. So we see there was 120 people. We know this from John, I mean from Acts chapter 1, verse 15. We know it said that Jesus, when Jesus ascended, there was approximately 120 people waiting. While those 120 people waiting, they were told to go back to Jerusalem and wait. Yeah. You wait on me. It's the hardest thing in the world to wait on people, ain't it? 
You know, yeah, I'm married. I have to wait on my wife. That's the hardest thing in the world. I'm thinking, my goodness. I tell her sometimes, let's leave. I tell her 15 minutes earlier than we need to leave because we ain't leaving at that time. <laughs> uh, so just telling you. But um, some people have different views. of. I always get there early. I'd rather get there early and be early and not be late. I can't stand to be late. Amen. If I'm late, something happened. I tell you that right now. So, but anyway, they said that uh, they, they were waiting on the Lord. It said, and suddenly, without warning, here they are in prayer, in fasting, in praying, in studying the scripture. We know they were doing that. And it says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. That means it came from up here. A sound from heaven. There was a rushing mighty wind. It wasn't blowing east to west, folks. It was blowing north to south. You understand? The wind was coming down, straight down. They felt the wind. They heard a mighty rushing wind. How many of you have ever been near a tornado? If you have, you've been on the news, right? I mean, it seems like everybody on the news of the tornadoes come by. If anybody sees any damage. You know, I think the TV people are desperate for, for news when a limb falls off a tree. They spend half the morning on WRL interviewing the poor lady that the tree fell in her house. Am I right? It was a tornado. It was a wind. It got it. But here they are. They're waiting in this room for the Holy Spirit to send like God told them to. And it was a wind, the Holy Spirit. Felt. Now the question was, was it wind they felt? Or was it the Holy Spirit they felt coming upon them? I would say both. Because it said it's the sound of a rushing mighty wind, but we know it was the Holy Spirit because God said, wait for the Holy Spirit. You know, how many of you have ever been in, uh, this is country folks. I'm a country folk too. Um, I lived in the city a little bit growing up, but uh, most of my life has been spent in Johnson County. And uh, how many of y'all have ever ridden on the back of a pickup truck going down the highway, 55 mile an hour or better? Now today people would have all kinds of seeing a young one out there hanging off the back of a tailgate. Wouldn't they? But all of us did that. We rode down the highway many times. The wind blowing out of the back of our hair, you know. We stand in the wind blowing in your face. You feel the power of the wind, don't you? And then you got dogs that ride with you. Them dogs will stick their head out and feel that power of that wind, right? You know what I'm talking about? There's, there's something about feeling the wind in your face. Some people ride motorcycles. They feel that wind in their face. I was wondering about the bugs, but I was wondering how do you deal with the bugs? I definitely have a mask. If I did, I would have a shield for sure. I mean, but anyway. Um, so the question is, what causes wind? You ever wonder about that? What causes wind? Wind is caused when there's two different, there are two different pressure systems. When there's a high pressure and a low pressure collide. When the high pressure and the low pressure collides, it causes wind. Now, in most cases, this uh, collision occurs over several states. You understand? I mean, we're talking thousands of miles it takes where it blends in together. So you have a small breeze. But when you have them collide together, suddenly you have a rushing wind, right? You have tornado, tornadic activities, or, or just straight line. You hear straight line winds? It's because you have this rushing in of these two different air, these two different pressure systems. Well, you know, this is what happened 2,000 years ago in history. We had difference in pressure systems. We have the worldly pressure of Satan and his army here on this earth, and in comes the pressure of the Holy Spirit and God's mighty power. And those two had to result in a high pressure wind coming in because that was a storm front, folks. Amen. To battle against the two was a strong storm front. The Bible says it was a mighty rushing wind. So today we're going to look at four changes that I saw that took place on Pentecost. The first one was the Holy Spirit baptism changed the Christian leadership. It changed the leaders. Uh, if you look at, remember in Acts chapter 1 verse 4 that we read already, Jesus told them to wait for the power. The leaders in the church had to wait. It's something we need to teach our leaders today, right? Wait on the Lord. Amen. Don't jump out and do something without praying and fasting and seeking God's will. Wait on the Lord. He told them to wait because you've got to wait till I give you the power. You've got to wait till the time is right. Now, you also, he said about baptism. Be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Baptism. 
Baptism was used by the Jews a long time before Christianity came around. The purpose for baptism was basically, basically two things. It was used as a sign for purification, for dedication, or a sign of conversion. So when the, when the Jews wanted to dedicate themselves, they would baptize, be baptized or purify themselves. They were, they were push, casting off things that they had done in their lives. They wanted to be purified. They gave it as a sign. The baptism itself didn't do anything. You understand? It was a symbol. Same thing as today, right? We get our, after we get saved, it says be saved and be baptized. But the baptism is of the Holy Spirit that we are instantly baptized with the Holy Spirit. But the physical sign that we get baptized is a sign to the world, right? It doesn't make you saved or lost. Amen. Um, I, had a, I went to Carolina Bible Institute and seminary in, in um, Pine Level many years ago. My, my mentor at the time was Dr. Floyd Cherry. You might even know Dr. Floyd Cherry. Well, Dr. Floyd Cherry was a great, great fine man of God. And um, uh, he said, he had, we had a discussion about baptism. Somebody said, what do you do if, uh, if somebody can't be baptized because they're, you know, they're laying in their beds and they can't be baptized? Do you, do you go up there and just kind of pour a little water on them? Or, or, you know, and, and Dr. Cherry said, no, you don't. If you can't do it right, don't do it at all. Because they ain't got to be baptized. Amen. The thief on the cross won't baptize unless it rained on him. He went to heaven. See, baptism is the first act that we do as a Christian to show the world that we're saved. If you don't follow him in baptism, if you're not willing to get baptized, are you, did, we, did you really mean business with God? But baptism was, was uh, it was used, uh, additionally it was used by, uh, the, to show that the people that were, um, um, the people that were became, becoming Jews, when the, when the heathen converted to Judaism, they would be baptized. Well, when the apostle, I mean, when, the, uh, uh, when John the Baptist came around, the last of the Old Testament prophets, he was already baptizing. He was baptizing in water. So remember, he said, I baptize you in water, but come one coming greater than me. Yeah. Right? One comes greater than me, I'm not worthy to latch his shoe. He was baptizing. And he was converting, the, he was baptizing them for those signs of purity and rededication and those people. Well, the baptism of the Holy Spirit does similar things. The baptism of the Holy Spirit purifies us, dedicates us, and demonstrates our conversion. Once we have the power of God. See, a Christian has the power of God. Amen. Uh, Jesus tells us in John 4, 23 through 24, he says, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is spirit and they, must worship, they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. See, the only way we can worship God is through the Holy Spirit in our lives. Our flesh can't stand before God. Our spirit can because our spirit is blended with the Holy Spirit. Our spirit is God's spirit. God sees Jesus in us and that's how we're able to commune with Him. Amen. That's right. See, that's the spirit that God has. The Holy Spirit baptism gives us as Christians power. Folks, you're powerful beings. Christians are the most powerful beings on this earth. Far more powerful than anything else. A Christian has power. We have God's power at our fingertips. Amen. You understand that? That says a lot. We have power. Uh, you know, if you have a car, a car needs to run, it needs gas, doesn't it? Yep. You know, if you have a car and it runs out of gas, it can't get nowhere until you get somebody to bring some gas. So say you own a car, and you don't get a gas, you, gotta, you can't get nowhere. So you own the car with gas, but you never crank it. You still ain't going nowhere, are you? You got a car, you don't crank it. Now, say you got a car, you got gas, and you crank it. But it sits in your yard. You still ain't going nowhere, are you? Until you crank it, until you get the car, fill it up with gas, crank it up, and put it in gear and hit the gas, you ain't going nowhere. Well, see, the Holy Spirit in your life of a Christian is just like that. Amen. As a Christian, you own the car. 
You had the gas in the tank. You got the ability to crank it up. Amen. But until you put it in gear and go down the road, you ain't, you're just wasting gas. Yep. See, the Holy Spirit is our gas. And He wants us to put it in gear. And He wants us to, to burn the highways up and down with your car, with your bodies, with your spirit. We see in uh, Acts chapter 2, I uh, mean, uh, so then, okay, so when the Holy Spirit came, everyone who believed on that day were filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, I wonder about this. The 120 in the room were praying for the Holy Spirit to come upon them, right? Yeah. And they got the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But they weren't the only Christians, were they? Mm-hmm. They weren't, <laughs> right? There was thousands of others who believed in Jesus that weren't in that room. Did they get the Holy Spirit on that same day? Yes, they did. You understand, when the Holy Spirit came, it came upon all of them. Now, when the Bible says, you know, they talked about somebody that they said they were saved, they said, did you get the Holy Spirit yet? And they said, no. That's because they had a mind knowledge, didn't have a heart knowledge. And so when Paul and Peter went to them, they gave them the information that they needed to hear the gospel and then accept it. Because uh, you can't be saved without the Holy Spirit. So there was other people around the world who on that day got the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that? Man, there was probably revivals breaking out all over the world where people had gone to hear the gospel. It says on verse 2 and 4, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. They immediately began to witness to other people in Jerusalem and the language that they could understand. This is a miracle. See, now these people, this was not an unknown tongue. Because it said they were speaking a language that the people understood. They heard the people speaking in their own language. Now guess what? They didn't need to. Because all these devout Jews who were in Jerusalem knew Hebrew. They could speak it. So what was the purpose of speaking in their own languages? First of all, to let them know this was, this was a miracle happening in front of their faces. Second of all, it was to let them know that God's word is spread in every language. That God is not a respecter of person, but He wants all to be saved. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. So they could take this message that was not just limited to the Jews and to the Hebrew, but was for everybody. That was the message that these leaders got. Um, There's a little illustration. There's a little boy was playing with his trucks in his backyard. He was moving some rocks and stones. You know, how many of you ever done that? Been in the yard and played with rocks. I, I did it all the time, you know. Uh, I had two brothers I didn't care for. And so I didn't really play with them. <laughs> and uh, my people, listen, they know it's true. But uh, we didn't get along growing up. We get along okay now. But uh, I would go out in the yard and play by myself. And so I would take and put, you know, have rocks and we put, put take me in and all that stuff. But there was this boy playing in the yard. And he was, uh, uh, he was trying to, he was trying to um, build this thing for his trucks in his backyard. And he had stones and rocks and stuff. And he was trying to create a road. And he comes across this rock that was blocking his pathway. And he used his toy bulldozer, you know, and he tried to push the rock out of the way, but it didn't budge. So he took his, he took his bulldozer and he rammed it into the rock. You know, you can see him. Didn't go nowhere. He took his dump truck and at the same time ramming his rock, you know, trying to get it to move that rock. Nothing happened. Still using his imagination, he said, okay, I'm going to be a helicopter. And he rose over top of the rock and he puts his hands down like he was a, a helicopter with a crane, you know, and he tries to pull up the rock to no avail. The boy suspended his creativity now for a moment. And said, you know, I just got to get this rock up. <laughs> so they weren't playing anymore now. All the playing was behind him now. Now it was serious. Now this rock was in my way. So now he's, he's there giving all he's got to get this rock up. Again, to no avail. So he just bent down beside the rock. And he started to cry. Because he'd done all he could do. His daddy comes by and sees him out there crying. And says, son, what are you doing? He said, well, I got this rock, and I can't get it up. And I've done everything I can do. He said, you've done everything you can do? He said, Daddy, I've done everything I can do. He said, no, you haven't. He said, what do you mean? I've done everything I can do. 
No, you haven't. He said, what do you mean? You haven't asked me to help you. So then the daddy reached over and picked up the rock and moved it out of the way. Amen. See, we need the help of the Father to help us move some of those stones that then we don't think we can move. Amen. See, God has the power to do anything. So they, they had to learn that they needed to follow that. The second thing we'll look at is the Holy Spirit changed, the Holy, the Holy Spirit baptism changed the individual Christians. Peter, before being filled with the power, remember Peter? Well, let's see. He was, his weak faith allowed him to step on the water, but then he began to sink. He had more faith than me because he stepped on the water, didn't he? <laughs> but his lack of faith caused him to sink. He's so weak he fell asleep when he was in the garden. And Jesus said, can you just pray with me a little while? And Jesus even said, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We also see that Peter was the one who denied Jesus three times. Yeah, amen. And then after Jesus even rose from the dead, Peter with his crowd sitting there saying, you know what, let's go a fishing. Peter said, I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of this. Let's just go back and fish. And he led the group with him. See, Peter didn't have what he needed. But then the Holy Spirit came. Amen. What a change in the life of Peter. That's right. What a change in the life of Peter. He wasn't perfect. We read sometimes that Paul had to chastise him for some things because he was still weak human, but he did not have a lack of faith anymore. He had power. We see in Acts 2, 14 through 15, he said, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour. See, G see Peter, uh, Peter was willing to stand up now, not just for Jesus, but for his brethren. Yeah. He had a new power about him. Amen. He was no longer afraid. He had power to stand up. We see in Acts 16 through 17. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. See, Peter proclaimed the power of God through the Holy Spirit. You know, there's a whole thing I've, I've been thinking, the Lord's been dealing with me for a while about this particular verse about young men will see visions and the old men shall dream dreams. And um, I don't have time to expound upon that other than simply saying that, you know, I think that means that, uh, uh, that we, as we get older, the things we wish we had done, things that we see that could be done that we didn't do when we were younger. God gives that. So therefore, guess what? Those that are older need to work with their younger people so that they have the power, the strength to do those things. Amen. The Holy Spirit directed Peter's preaching of the Savior. In verse 27, he talks about the sinless Savior. In verse 22, he talks about the accepted Savior that Jesus showed, that God showed Jesus through miracles and wonders. We see the rejected Savior, the crucified Savior, the risen Savior, the glorified Savior, and the soon returning Savior. See, Peter, through the Holy Spirit, had the message of God. Because without the Holy Spirit, you can't provide the message of God. There's churches today where the Word of God will not be preached, where social groups will gather, who are in favor of things that are abomination to God, and you cannot be that way and be a Christian. It's impossible. It's impossible. It is impossible. You cannot do things that are against God and be godly. It's impossible. Holy Spirit won't let you. Amen. The Bible says sometimes, and some sleep. So in other words, if you continue to do things as a Christian you shouldn't do, God will kill you. He'll just take you out of the way. See? Anyway, Peter preached to the crowd, we see also. He says in verse 23 that they, these people were culpable to his death. He didn't need, they need, and they needed to be repent and be baptized. Peter not just tells them about Jesus, he refers it to them. Listen, you folks killed him, crucified him, and you need to repent and be baptized. Acts, 20, Acts 2, 21 says, And if ye shall come, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, he didn't just tell them about their state of hopelessness. He told them a way to recover from that. That's good preaching there. Right? 
telling somebody how, where they are, but not leaving them lost. Peter is an example of a change in the life of Christians. The third thing, the Holy Spirit baptism changed the response of the crowd. See, the Holy Spirit, what changes the crowd, I always said this, I'm not responsible for the results, I'm responsible for the effort. You hear me? You're never responsible for the results. You can't make someone get saved or get right with God. That's a choice they make because God gives them that choice. Amen. Everyone has a choice. We have a free will Amen. to do that, to accept or to reject. That's right. That is our choice. As I said, we started with, I'm a Christian, my choice. Right. See, they had a choice to make. But God can, through His Holy Spirit, convict you of your sins. Remember what... God told Peter, I mean, God told Paul on the road to Damascus, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. You know what's coming. I've been working on you for a while, Paul. It's not easy. He says, uh, Therefore let all the house of Israel surely know that God has made the same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So this is the same crowd that crucified Jesus. He said, after the Spirit, though, he says in verse 37, Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And said unto Peter, to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They admitted their sin. They admitted that they were guilty. Because see, you got to know your sins. you got to admit that you have sins. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Today, if you're saved, if you get saved today, you have the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is, comes, it's a joint package, folks. And they got that today. They said, gladly. Then it says in verse 41, Then they that gladly received his words were baptized, and the same day they were added to them about 3,000 souls. Yeah. See, because the preaching of God's word and because of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit in the lives of these people, they went from being a crowd that crucified Christ to a crowd that worshipped and served the Savior. What a change! We think about the miracle change of Peter. Think about the change of the crowd. See, God can change the crowds around you. Amen. The Holy Spirit is powerful. The Holy Spirit changed the church. Amen. Before the Holy Spirit, the church hid in silence with little or no convents, converts. On the Holy Spirit, but when, after the Holy Spirit dwelt the church, we see in verse 42, and they continued steadfast in the apostle doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. See, the church got into the word. Bible doctrine. Churches that don't, I tell you what, I'm so saddened by the church replacing the preaching of the word for other things, aren't you? Amen. Amen. There's nothing wrong with social groups and small groups and things of that nature and singing meetings. And those are great having their place, but don't replace preaching for it. Because it's through the foolishness of preaching Amen. that men Amen. are saved. Amen. And so if you don't preach the word, they can't get saved. Amen. That's Bible, not David Barber. The church increased their Christian fellowship, family of God, because with the Holy Spirit in among you, you're going to grow closer to each other. Why? Because you have a common spirit. The church spends more time on prayer for one another and around the world together. They recognize the need to be communing with the Father. The church makes it a point to praise God for His mercies and blessings, and the Lord uses the church to add daily as such should be saved. Conclusion. So, the Holy Spirit was sent to change. The Christian leaders, he, he was sent to change the Christian leaders by giving them power to preach and lead by example. Church leaders lead by example. The Holy Spirit gives them the power to lead. Your deacons have power. God gives them special powers to lead. The individual Christians are changed by the Holy Spirit by giving them the ability to stand and witness even in hard places. God gives you the power to stand the Holy Spirit gets, can, draw their, can, can change the response of the crowd by convicting them of their sins and drawing them to the Son. And the church, he, he changes the church by giving them the power to love, to worship, and to care for others. Let me ask you a question, several things today. If you're not saved today, first of all, let me tell you, the Holy Spirit is right here. Amen. He's here among us. 
I know it. I feel him, don't you? I feel his presence right here. So I know he's here. I know he's in our midst. And I know there's others who have him. So therefore, we're filled up in this room with the Holy Spirit right now. And if you're not saved, the Holy Spirit is here talking with you, working on your heart, saying, today, 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 there is no promise of tomorrow. He's real, and he's not going away. Be like the people in Jerusalem the day of Pentecost over 2,000 years ago where they heard and they were converted and they were changed. If you're saved today, don't let Satan convince you that you are powerless. That's the biggest lie Satan can give you, Amen. that you are powerless, that you are nobody. You are a child of the king. Amen. You are a child of God. You have within you the holy power of God. There is no power greater in heaven and earth than the Holy Spirit's power in your life. You are powerful. Don't let Satan it out, as a little kid song sings, right? Peter embraced the power of the Holy Spirit and it changed all Jerusalem in a day. You can ask God to give you the power by forgiving you of your sins and stand in your way. Holy Spirit can fill you so the world looks at you in amazement. I think uh, it was uh, Dwight Moody, D.L. Moody, I think, said that the world is yet to see a man who is solely on fire by God that he's like a match. You light it and the world watches him burn. And yeah, it may burn you. And it may shrink in your life, but the world needs a light. Finally, to the church, God has proved, provided us His Holy Spirit to lead and direct our paths, to lead us in love for our neighbors and witnessing to the lost around us. Now, we have a car. We have the key. We need to put it in drive and hit the gas. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we're so thankful we have this opportunity. We can come to your house. We can worship you. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, for your mighty power in our lives. We pray, Lord, you'd help these Christians leave here today feeling uplifted, knowing that they possess the greatest power that mankind and all, all anybody in, in, in any nation, any, any entity, Satan and all his minions could, could come up to with, that they know the power of, of the Holy Spirit dwells within these individuals in this congregation today. I pray, Lord, you help them to know that and feel that strength and whatever. If they've got stuff in their lives, Lord, that's hindering them, I pray, Lord, you help them to understand they can defeat anything through the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. I pray, Lord, if there's someone here today that's not saved, that your convicting power would be upon them so bad that they could not leave the doors of this church without saying, hey, I need help today. I need to know him today. I feel his power. I know his ability. I know he can do it. I know he can change me from the weak person that I am to understanding and on the right path with you. I want to be by choice a Christian today. I pray for that. I pray for this church, Lord, as you give them this time. As we know, Lord, that all churches are struggling with this pandemic and things going around and, and members sometimes seem to wander away in times like this. I pray, Lord, for this church body that you would be with them. Hold them. Hide them behind the cross. Give them the gas in their tank. Give them the ability, Lord, to put it in gear and let them, Lord, spread the word around their community because of the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your Son, who died on the cross for our sins. Help us, Lord, to ever put you forefront in everything we do and say. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time and your attention.